sin. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent. According to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord, and grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. O Almighty God, who alone canst order the unruly wills and affections of sinful men, grant unto thy people that they may love the thing which thou commandest, and desire that which thou dost promise, that so among the sundry and manifold changes of the world our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Let us all say together Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then were we like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then, the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad indeed. Restore our fortunes, O Lord like the watercourses of the Negev. Those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go about weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. A reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians. 
If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal, goal for the price, price of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Now six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead, and there they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ.
Please be seated. It's a delight. Quite a long time. I think it was way pre-COVID, some, somewhere back in, in the Middle Ages, it seems like now. This is my last Sunday to preach and celebrate Mass until after Easter. So I decided to do something different today than I usually do. In fact, perhaps different than I've ever done. Whether it will work out or not, I don't know. So then, today is what we used to call Passion Sunday in the old days. The beginning of Passion Tide. That was the calendar of the old liturgies, which were all revised in the 1970s. And now we wait for Passion Season to begin on Palm Sunday. But in the Church of England, the old usage still prevails. The last two weeks of Lent are Passion Tide. And that makes a certain amount of sense to me. If we start thinking about the passion of our Lord today, then we are ready for the liturgies of Holy Week. What I would like to do today is tell the story of the passion of our Lord, but in a larger context than perhaps you've heard before. So let me begin in an odd place with a news article I just read this last week. The Hubble Telescope has made it possible for scientists now to see the most distant object ever perceived by human beings. It is a star that they named Arendelle, which means morning star in Old English. And the light that was seen from this star traveled 12.9 billion years in order to be observed here on Earth. Now, ordinarily, that light wouldn't be visible at all. But because of the quirky character of space-time, explained, as you all remember, no doubt, by Einstein, <laughs> a huge galaxy cluster bent the, life ar the light around it and enabled the Hubble telescope to see it. It's estimated that this star was 50 times the size of our own sun. And it's actually probable that stars like this no longer even exist in our universe, since they belong to that first generation or so when the universe was relatively new, about 800 million years old. The Big Bang, or the Great Radiance, as someone called it, that started everything all off occurred about 13.7 billion years ago. And we have known this more or less accurately since 2003, when a team of researchers discovered background radiation dating from that original burst of energy, which was the beginning of our universe. All of the elements of the universe have been created by the huge stellar furnaces of that first generation of stars or so. They exploded, as then new made elements were scattered every corner of every galaxy of which there are billions in our universe. Everything that exists, especially all life forms, derive from these exploding stars, including us human beings. Has anyone ever told you that you are made of stardust? True. Our own solar system, formed from clouds of dust about 4.6 billion years ago, it is thought that the first photosynthesizing bacteria evolved somewhere around 2.2 to 2.9 billion years ago. It was only 2 million years ago that our immediate hominid ancestors appeared and the creatures that we would recognize as strange but as one of us appeared about 300,000 years ago. Now, as interesting as all this is, you might wonder what it has to do with the passion. Well, it seems to me that the answer is very much and in every way. All of this time that I have oversimplified in my little story is what lots of theologians call the first incarnation. What could be known of God was imprinted and fleshed in the stuff of the world. With the arrival of human beings, the universe arrived at that point toward which God had been attracting and nudging it ever since the Big Bang. There's still a long way to go then, but it's obvious that the energy which burst into space-time 
13.7 billion years ago is God's own energy, God's own life, because there's none other available. Here's what a recent author says about this. God's bestowal of grace began with time itself. It is interwoven in our history. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, all creation has been pressured from within to evolve. Inert matter evolved, becoming ever more conscious until at a particular moment in the concrete history of the world, self-reflective consciousness emerged in a species that we call human. The material universe that came into existence and was maintained by grace finally became aware of the grace that had been there all along, the self-communication of the holy that was at the heart of all life. So the universe is created, has emerged from God's own self, God's own life and energy. In fact, there's nothing in the universe except energy, as far as we can tell. The universe itself is a vast field or fields of energy, all interacting with each other, producing what we see and what we don't see. Maybe 90% of the universe, in fact, is actually what they call dark matter or dark energy, which we know must be there, but which we can't even detect yet. It takes a universe, oddly enough, as vast as this one is, to make possible an Earth like ours. And from the time that human beings first appeared and began asking questions, they've wondered about their place in this world and have mostly been religious people, perceiving that there was a divine dimension to existence which was mysterious to them. All over the world, various communities of people developed their own religions and spiritualities, including the Middle East and that tribe that we know as the Hebrews. Our Old Testament comes from their long history as a people, as a people trying to make sense of God and of their place in the world. What we have to understand in all of this is that God was constantly at work bestowing God's own self on this world. Remember, there's no other life available than God's. Everything comes from the divine energy. And God is at work sharing that divine life and that grace with all who are able to receive them. But then about 2,000 years ago, something new happened. A human being was born who was able to receive in a unique way all the divine energy that God had bestowed on this world. He received it so perfectly that he became the human face of God to all those who lived and worked with him. He was the heir to the long history of God with the Hebrew people, but the heir as well to the whole story of cosmic evolution, even though he didn't know the story as we do these days. As you might expect, he did something crucially important and new. He revealed how this divine energy was meant to be known and to be lived. As a recent author put it, more than anything else, Jesus signaled a new consciousness, a new way of looking at God, self, and others. This new consciousness crystallized in the image of the kingdom of God. The here and now reality that he never tired of living and inviting others to enter. The word incarnation literally means in the flesh and the kingdom of God was the reality in which consciousness heralded by Jesus could be in flesh. You remember every day and in every way he spoke about the kingdom. He illustrated it. He lived it. And without a knowledge of the kingdom of God, we cannot really understand his death. Now, maybe after what I've said so far, it will not surprise you to hear that the best description I've ever heard of the kingdom of God is as an energy field. Jesus revealed the energy that upholds and directs the universe as love, divine love. The kingdom of God is not a new kind of domination system. 
by which those on God's side are able to conquer and manage the rest of the world. It's rather the place of conscious cooperation of human freedom and consciousness with divine love. It is an acceptance of what God has been trying to share with his human creatures ever since they came to consciousness and long before. What Jesus lived and died was the pouring out of the divine love toward others, holding nothing back. <clears throat> the incarnation of God's Son is the manifestation of what it looks like when humanity and divinity, God and human, are fully conjoined. It is the second incarnation after the first one of creation. God always intended such a thing so as to show us all that was in God's heart. And what was and is in God's heart is love. Love for all his creation and a call to all creatures to share in that love and become channels for it. It is the very energy of the universe, the energy field that holds everything together and leads it into the future. The kingdom of God is then an image indicating this whole energy toward love that Jesus outlined in the Sermon on the Mount, Paul talked about, and that most early Christians, I think, understood. The most beautiful recent definition of the kingdom of God, in my opinion, is by an author named Judy Canato, who says, it is a field of compassion where love is the operating procedure and genuine concern for the other is the behavioral norm. Now, why should such a ministry of compassion, such as Jesus embodied, lead him to a cross? Someone recently put it this way. If Jesus had just stuck to healing people, being loved, exercising demons, and so forth, he probably wouldn't have been killed. But his teaching about compassion led him also to take a stand over against those forces that worked against compassion in his own day. Those who were in charge of both temple and state, the priestly leaders and the Roman political authorities, as well as the revolutionaries around who wanted to fight with Rome, they did not want to hear about love or compassion for the other, for the enemy. Compassion was no way to manage either a temple or a government. Rulers operated according to a system known as the domination system, in which strong men, and it was mostly men, gained power and loaded it over others. This system had gotten quite developed by Jesus' day. The Romans were masters at the brutal control of conquered peoples, and then they dared to call it peace, the Pax Romana. Jesus set himself against all these systems. That, in fact, is the whole meaning of the temptations of Jesus in the gospel. The devil is the one who knows that system through and through. Now, Jesus seemed to feel that it was part of his teaching of the kingdom to confront those dominant powers of his day, the Jerusalem religious authorities and the Roman political authorities. He was warned, as we heard a couple of Sundays ago in our gospel lesson, that Herod was out to kill him, that Jerusalem was too dangerous of a place for him, but he felt that he had to take his message there, if only to show his fellow countrymen that the path that so many of them were taking toward military confrontation with Rome would end in disaster. So he confronted the powers, and the cost of that confrontation was his own execution as a political revolutionary, which almost everyone knew was a lie. So the passion of our Lord, it was the end that his life had come to by insisting that the historic contests between powerful leaders for dominance was demonic and contrary to God's will. It was the price he paid for teaching the love of the enemy. It was the death he died for teaching that violence was no answer to injustice, but that in fact it always led to greater violence. He warned his fellow countrymen they were courting disaster, and so he went ahead of them and courted that disaster himself. He poured out the love of God on the cross as he had done in his whole life, and as God had poured out that love on the whole creation from the beginning. 
So as we come to the Passion, we do not see Jesus dying for our own personal sins <clears throat> so much as for re resisting the structural evils of his own world. And he taught that we have to learn a way of dying to ourselves, to the demands of our egos and our customary ways, just as Paul pointed out in our epistle this morning, so that we can learn to live out of the same love that he lived. He was willing to love to the end, and we can learn that same way of love. God did not punish Jesus because we sinned. God did not withhold forgiveness for us until his son was sacrificed. Jesus followed his own way of love no matter where it led, and in the agonies of his passion demonstrated that God had really been suffering with his creation ever since the beginning. For the way evolution seems to work is by death and rebirth. One generation passes away in order for new things to emerge. Suffering is the price of existence, but not all of it. The damage to the weak and vulnerable that the strong and dominant have wrought was not part of the plan, nor God's will for his creatures. And yet we've lived with it so long that we almost consider it normal. And that is what Jesus confronted. The way of understanding, this way of understanding the passion requires some changes of emphasis. We so often try to take on personal guilt at the foot of the cross. Some of my most beloved passion hymns speak of my own personal blame. But the, one, the thing we have to remember is that Jesus did not die on the cross to assuage God's wrath or to, or to take our blame. He showed us that if we had thought of God as our heavenly judge and as a taskmaster that we could never please enough, then we were wrong. We are and always have been God's beloved children. The cross shows us that Jesus loved us all, even to death. But then, of course, the unexpected happened. I mean, I say, of course, because we know how the story ends, even though they didn't at the time. Jesus rose from the dead. I don't want to, even if I could, try to explain the resurrection. The point is that what looked like defeat on Good Friday was known as victory on Easter Day. The powers ranged against Jesus on the cross were not able to hold him. He burst out to new life and love in a way that was far more than he had been as the human Jesus. He was now seen to be Christ, the risen Lord. His was the kind of life that proved to his fearful disciples that the way of love that he preached was actually vindicated. He spoke to them now from a place of personal power, spiritual power, the likes of which they'd never known. And what is more, the disciples were able to be filled with his own spirit to the point of carrying on his kingdom work, living into that force field of the spirit, the field of compassion. And so there we are, all these years later. The 2,000 years since Jesus have been a mixed blessing for us, as all human things are. The church has made some huge errors in accommodating itself to the domination systems of this world. But the spirit is blowing from a new direction these days, urging us to take on the work of the kingdom again, being participants in the Jesus movement, as our presiding bishop often keeps reminding us. We can encounter the risen Lord ourselves and allow his spirit to make us channels of that one love which is the life of the world. Our times require it. Its fulfillment is our hope for the future. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Would you stand with me, please, as we continue in the words of the Nicene Creed? I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. 
and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man, was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord. And grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in thy mercy. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Doug, our bishop, and Michelle, our priest, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. Lord, in thy mercy. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. Lord, in thy mercy. We beseech thee also, so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of our government in this and every land, especially Joe, our president, Eric, our governor, and Tom, our mayor, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Lord, in thy mercy. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. Lord, in thy mercy. We must humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor Mary, Alda, Tim, Bill, Gordy, Marilyn, Virginia, Linda, John, Tom, Megan, Winnie, Steve, Rebecca, Lauren, Helen, Barb, Doris, and Mary Ann all immigrants and refugees and all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in thy mercy. We commend to your gracious care and keeping all the men and women of our armed forces at home and abroad. Defend them day by day with thy heavenly grace and grant them a sense of thy abiding presence wherever they may be. Lord, in thy mercy. Holy Creator, as the pandemic begins to ebb, we ask for your continued protection and guidance. For those that are weary from caring for the ill, we ask for refreshment. For those who have suffered from the disease, we ask for restoration to health. And for all of us, we continue to ask your wisdom in our daily decisions 
as we move into this new season of COVID. Lord, in thy mercy. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, especially Jim, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service and to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, St. Paul, and all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Lord, in thy mercy. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, guide the nations of the world into the way of justice and truth, and establish among them the peace, which is the fruit of righteousness, that they may become the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with thy spirit. for me to remember those who are celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. Are any persons here present celebrating birthdays? I have a, a note here that Greg Harold and Megan Floyd have a birthday this week. Are any, are, are y'all here? Either of you? No? Okay. And also, we are bidden to remember Jim and Jackie Collingwood, uh, Mother Michelle said they would have had an anniversary this week, uh, but uh, Jim has departed this life apparently fairly recently. I wasn't quite sure about that. Let us pray then for these folks. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who celebrate their birthdays and for the wife of Jim who realizes that their anniversary is coming up. May they be filled with love and hope and joy and also great expectations of life still going on in a future that belongs to you and your cooperation with them and theirs with you. Bless those people, Lord, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. And now I believe there are some announcements that will be... As we all can tell today, uh, Mother Michelle is uh, has a week of relaxation before Holy Week comes up and all the different things that she has to get prepared for for that. Uh, please don't try contacting her. You might just get her voicemail on that. Um, but we'd like to thank for coming today and being with us. I know he's another one of our Johns that like to supply for us. Um, uh, this week, we still do have uh, rosary and the Anglican prayers on Wednesday night. That's the last of them, because we do not have them during Holy Week. We have our other services available during that week as well. And then if you are regular for Thursday morning, uh, we are taking the time off for Thursday morning, and we're going to gather again um, after Easter on the 21st. And we're going to do the study of the book of Daniel. And I believe uh, Mother Michelle has videos and things to go along with that that she's been working on um, for that, for those people for morning prayer. And on Saturday, to help at 9 a.m., we do have a uh, cleanup, just various odd things throughout the church that our regular cleaners do not get to. So we like to make it uh, beautiful for Easter, so when our guests come um, during that, so everything looks nice. And helps for us today. One is for anybody that wants to give uh, for flowers, and those are Easter flowers. The other one is for anybody that wants to donate money on Easter in lieu of a regular uh, Easter um, donation on that with the envelopes. And then uh, Sue wants to remind us that if you have not picked up your financial statements today that were handed out to you as you walked in, 
Um, they would be by the door as well, or the ushers know where they are to hand them out to you for that. Is there anything? Okay, I think we have everything. On the okay. One more thing. Anyone who's reading in the Passion, please stay behind today for a brief uh, rehearsal. So we have a rehearsal of the Passion coming up after church on that. And as well, coffee hour in our hall after service. And I believe that's it. And may the Lord be with you. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty, everlasting God, 
who dost bid thy faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that fervent in prayer and in works of mercy and renewed by thy word and sacraments, they may come to the fullness of grace which thou hast prepared for those who love thee. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord Most High. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All glory be to thee, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, for that thou of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made thereby his one oblation of himself once offered, full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice, until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we, thy humble servants, do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts which we off now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body, and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world, grant us thy peace. The gifts of God for the people of God. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood that we may ever more dwell in him and he in us. Amen.
Let us pray using the post-communion prayer in your bulletin. In union, O Lord, with the faithful people at every altar of thy church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, we desire to offer to thee praise and thanksgiving. We remember thy death, Lord Christ. We proclaim thy resurrection. We await thy coming in glory. And since some of us cannot receive thee today in the sacrament of thy body and blood, we beseech thee to come spiritually into our hearts, cleanse and strengthen us with thy grace, Lord Jesus, and let us never be separated from thee. May we live in thee and thee in us, in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Look with compassion, O Lord, upon this your people, that rightly observing this holy season, they may learn to know you more fully and to serve you with a more perfect will through Christ our Lord. Amen. Life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So be quick to love, make haste to be kind, and go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank you, God.